Okay, now you have that in your mind now, your first sexual experience. Now, who wants to volunteer to come up here and we're going to get everybody in the room to ask you detailed questions about that first sexual experience? Who, who wants to come? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Like Jimmy said, before Child Protect, an eight-year-old, imagine that was your first sexual experience when you were eight years old and it was a relative, a father, a stepfather, an uncle, a grandfather, someone in your family that you loved and trusted and that was your first sexual experience. And so you come into the system and you have to tell in detail to a prosecutor, to law enforcement, to DHR, to a principal, a teacher, a school nurse, a number of people and you are reliving that trauma and that abuse over and over and over again. We're adults. And so how embarrassing would it be if you had to come up here and we all ask you questions, detailed questions, about your first sexual experience. So, uh -oh, back to the end. this is Child Protect and we're going to talk a little bit about why children don't have to do that in our community. This is our building. It's on, at 935 South Perry Street. It was built in 1959, complete with a nuclear fallout shelter. So we are prepping. And so, if, you know, when the end comes, y'all are all welcome. We got a lot of ramen noodles, some raviolis, and it's going to be a good time at 935. Right. Um, that's our building. You'll see these handprints on canvas throughout the presentation. At the end of every year, we get a different class, a preschool, a kindergarten, first or second grade, and they put a handprint that represents every single child that we saw that year. It's not the actual children, because when you're in Child Protect at 1 a.m. and children have witnessed the murder of someone in their family, you don't really want to get the paint out and say, hey, can we get your, your handprint? So this is at the end of the year, so you'll see these throughout. When we moved into this building, it became a very, very impressive art piece. And it was real cheap, because we buy the canvas, we give it to the school, and they provide the handprints. Okay, the history of Child Protect. We were incorporated in 1989. We are one of the oldest advocacy centers in the country. Bud Kramer, many of you may recognize his name. He used to be a prosecutor in Madison County, Huntsville area, and then he went on to be a congressman. Very, very out front and out of the box when it came to child issues. As he was prosecuting cases in the 70s and early 80s, he was losing most of them. Prosecutors don't like to lose, right, Jimmy? And so he was losing most of these child abuse cases because the child had been talked to for so many times. So eight-year-old Susie, who's been molested by her grandfather, has already talked to all the people I just listed. So now it's 12 or 18 months later, and she's in court, and she's on the stand. So the defense attorney's asking her questions and said, well, when you told the police officer you said you had shorts on, when you talked to DHR a month later you said you had jeans on, so you're probably lying about everything. So he was losing cases, and one of the reasons why is because the children, it sounded like they were lying or making stuff up or not, the stories weren't fitting. Well, if I ask all of you this morning together what you had for breakfast today, you could all tell me. We'd all hear the same thing. But over the course of the next 12 months, if I ran into you each individually and I said, what'd you have for breakfast on Wednesday, August 16th, all the stories would be different. It's not that you would be lying, but that's just how we tell stories. So Bud Kramer established the first advocacy center in Huntsville, Alabama. It's now known as the National Children's Alliance, it's the Children's Advocacy Center in Huntsville. And he did this so that children could go to a neutral, standalone, one place where professionals were trained specifically to talk about abuse to children. Now there are 30 throughout the state. As I said, Child Protect was incorporated in 1989, and there are about 1,000 throughout the country and one in Iceland. Don't tell me why. I don't know if there's a lot of abuse in Iceland or what, what goes on up there, but that was the first international one that was established in Iceland. I am, um, I get to do this, but I want to introduce the staff. Um, Tracy Lachance is our advocate, 
and she is a former uh, investigator with MPD, so we knew her very well, about 17 years before she came to us. Abraham and Kristen, they are forensic interviewers slash counselors, so they are the wonderful people that talk to the kids. <coughs> Laurel is our development director, um, AKA, like we all do, we wear a lot of different hats. Tamara Martin is our forensic interviewer backup, and she is Willow's handler. If y'all can see Willow under the table, and afterwards, photos with Willow are ten dollars a piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just kidding, just kidding. But um, we'll talk more about that. But it was good to be able to recognize the staff at this point um, as well. So this is our waiting room. Now, you can see that it's a lot more welcoming than if you had to go down to the police station or to DHR. So the children come in, they're welcome, everything's on their level, we're great to see them, and it's, it's really all about the kids that day. This is the other side of the waiting room. Little side note, this building was built by Dr. Weinrib in 1959. He was a general practitioner here. And this waiting room, I'll go back, is all one, I couldn't take a picture of that one, but you can see the desk. This was the first integrated waiting room, physician's waiting room in Montgomery. Uh, Dr. Weinrib was practicing with someone over on Court Street, and they can, wanted to continue to have an integrated waiting room. And he said, no, I'm going out, I'm building my own building. It's gonna have an, an integrated, way, I mean segregated is, is partner, sorry. And we're gonna have a nuclear fallout shelter. So go Dr. Weinrib for that forward thinking. <laughs> that was kind of a joke. Y'all, is everybody asleep? <laughs> um, we moved into this building before. Y'all know where Wall Street, uh, Walmart is on Ann Street. Our building used to be there. It was a little house. Um, Bob Bailey, Judge Bob Bailey, Family Court, he is my husband. Bob was actually a founding member of the Child Protect. And uh, we had a little house on Ann Street. This was way before Jana. But um, we moved into this building in December, of uh, November of 2003, it was me driving the U-Haul with some wonderful members of the jail at the county. And they helped me load everything. We moved into the building and we paid it off in 2006. The building was named after my brother who passed away of cancer and he was just, um, loved. he was a kid himself at 39 when he passed away. He still was all about kids. So um, it's almost like I can never leave since his name is on the building, but that's my true reason. Um, okay, so after the interview is over, then they, the children get to pick out a new teddy bear. And we say new because we don't want the crunchy animals that you've had in the attic and mom balls from the fair 20 years ago. Because we are real good at cleaning out nasty stuff. So um, those bears end up on the curb. But we ask new because it's a new beginning. These children deserve that. And so um, they get to go and pick it out. It gives them a choice because during their abuse, obviously, they don't have a choice in things. This is our long haul. The building's really big. It doesn't look that way. But, and you can see the, uh, the uh, handprints. There's some more. This one's real cute, a little, little um, giraffe with some balloons. The teachers really do a great job. We serve two judicial circuits. About four years ago, um, Bonnie said the 15th Circuit is Montgomery County, the 19th is Mag uh, Otaga, Elmore, and Chilton County. Four years, well, no, it's been longer than that. It was 2008 when the economy just bottomed out and everything was going really south. Um, we lost a lot of funding. We had to do some layoffs. So at that time, I went to the board and I said, we are not seeing as many children from Chilton County because they've had to come so far. Parents are getting laid off, they can't afford gas, and I said, we need to start a satellite office in Chilton County if we're <coughs> going to continue to serve these kids. So the board said, well, we don't have money to do that. We're, we're already getting cut, you're having to lay off people, you know, we're not going to be able to do that until the economy gets better. And so my response was, so our mission is to raise money and then serve kids. Mm -hmm. To raise money and then serve kids. And then they said, oh, I guess not. So um, I was very persuasive, and we opened a satellite office. In the year following that satellite office, our forensic interviews doubled of what we had been seeing. So you can see it work. So Chilton County is out of that now because four years ago they became incorporated. They're their own advocacy center now. 
October of last year, uh, we're on a fiscal year, so the end of 2016, we had interviewed 658 children in the three counties. 65% of what we see is child sex abuse with the staff that you just met. So it's like, do you ever get to take a coffee break? Well, sometimes we do, but mostly no, because we are all working. And so once again, I went to the board last September and I said, we've got, these two counties have got to go under Butterfly Bridge because Montgomery is the county that we are seeing most of the increase in. And we've got to do better by these kids. We've got to do better with training our teams and training our staff and being able to provide more counseling. So last October, a talk in Elmore County, we started satellite offices, and this October they will officially go under Butterfly Bridge. So that is that's huge in every way. We have already seen the numbers increase since we have offices in both counties now. So it really does happen. You build it and they will come. Okay, our board of directors, I'll let you look at this. Um, you may recognize some names, maybe not. We have 15 members on our board and we keep it small because we're a small agency. So if a board member doesn't show up for a board meeting, everybody knows because there are only 15 chairs that fit around our table. So everybody knows that. Um, now, I took this because this is our reception area. This is where the advocate sits. But I wanted to show you that instead of mugs of our past presidents, our little tagline is, when you do something for Child Protect, you leave your handprint on the heart of a child. So behind here, these are all the past president's handprints that they left on the heart of a child. So we invented that too, so feel free to use it any, anytime. It's better than black and white photos of past presidents. And we have a junior board. Um, I, let's see, Sandy is here, Jamal is here, Keisha is here. Anybody else on our junior board? Anybody? Um, Christy Duhon, who is now with the Alabama Network of Children's Advocacy Center, she moved up and out of our agency. She used to do our advocacy at Child Protect, and she started the junior board. And Laurel has come in and taken over, and we were one of the first um, nonprofits in the city to form a young, energetic, let's do some new things out of the box um, junior board, and they are wonderful. I can't say enough about them. And let me tell you what, I thought that interviewing for our board of directors was hard. They put you through the ringer. It is not like a done deal. They, they really do a lot of interviewing and vetting on that. Um, this is our, this used to be the old x-ray room. And so this is where the board meetings are and where we have our multidisciplinary team meetings. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Okay, and our staff, you've met everybody. Emily is not here today. Emily has been tasked with opening the satellite offices. So Emily will be moving. Well, she's already lives in Prattville, but she will be overseeing those two offices in uh, Taga and Elmore County. And then that's everywhere else. We don't have um, an organizational chart as a pyramid or those little lines that come down. We are all spokes in a wheel. This is in alphabetical order. It just happens to be that Bailey is my first name and I happen to come first in that. I really am at the bottom. Um, I, I really, I've always been said, if you get in a position to hire, you hire better than yourself. You hire smarter than yourself. You hire everything, you know, on top of yourself. And that's what I've done. So I just wanted y'all to know that we're in the spokes. Everybody's equal. Everybody has a job to do. And I think that's really important when you're dealing with the subject matter that we do. Here's our great staff. It's kind of dark. This is at our event, Chairs for Children, um, that we have done every April for the past 10 years. And um, Emily's in this, and who's missing? Tracy it was not here yet, so um, that's Emily by me. And we, we have a great time at Child Protect in spite of. And Willow, our staff member. So there's Willow, um, her portrait. Okay, we partner, um, I think I said, with law enforcement, the Department of Human Resources. Every other week we have multidisciplinary team meetings where we sit the assistant district attorney that prosecutes and our, our adult offenders facilitates the meeting. It's made up of everybody that has anything to do with that child. We sit around, we talk, what's best for the child? Oh, the offender's dead. Okay, well that's not gonna go to court, darn it, he's dead, but um, the child may still need counseling. So there are a lot of services and resources that we give to the families and to the children 
besides just the interview and counseling. And it is a multidisciplinary team approach, and that is real important too, because everybody gets their say, and you're really trying to do what's best for that child. Okay, we already talked about this, but I thought you would like to see Jessica at five. And this is kind of what it looked like prior to the advocacy centers, all the people she had to talk to and go to court. And so now she just goes, oh, did I forget to turn it over? Oh, I forgot the back. There's the back of this. Sorry. It shows where she just comes to chopper tech. Y'all can use your imagination. Okay. The forensic interview. So what happens? How do the kids get to us? So teacher, Susie tells teacher, dad has been doing this to me. Teacher calls DHR. DHR in our state is the mandated agency to investigate child abuse cases. So DHR will call us and say, hey, I need to bring a child in. Susie, she's eight years old. Um, when can you see her? And we say, right now. We always say, right now. And so, it's, you know, sometimes it's like, well, she hadn't seen the dad in two weeks, and she's not going back till Christmas, so, and mom's working, so we'll do it for next week. If it's chronic, then it's not as imperative to see it right away, but if it's an acute abuse that has just happened, then we see them right away. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Both the investigators from the agencies have to be there in order for us to do an interview because we don't have any, we can't take kids out of the home, we can't make arrests, so they have to be present for us to do it. Interview room, um, I'll fix it. This is the interview room. The older children, one child, we do one interview at a time. The child would sit here, the interviewer over here. That little gray bench is for Willow because Willow gets to go in the interviews too if the child wants. So we got the bench so that Willow would be a little bit eye level for the kids. And it's amazing. It's amazing to watch. So that's the interview room. You see the little table over here. Um, you see the tablet, the plate of the crayons. That's for the younger children. Our camera adjusts so that we can adjust it and zoom in on the child's face, a law enforcement DHR. The only people allowed in this room during the interview are the interviewer and the child. And it is recorded. Um, the monitoring, this is the monitoring room. You see the tablet there. And then you can see the TV back there with the little table on it. Um, they're able to feed questions. So the investigators, like I said at the very beginning, how everybody needs their questions answered. The investigators feed questions to the interviewer on the tablet, and they're able to ask them to the child. So all three of these people will go to court, and they'll be able to say, at noon on August 16th, this is what Susie said to me, all their stories were matched because they heard it the same. Susie's told her story one time. The only people allowed in this room are the investigators because if anyone else was in there, they could be subjected to going to court as well. And you don't, the minimum amount of people tell, talking about this, the better. Um, this is our consultation room. That's a little dark too, sorry about that. Um, this is after the interview, DHR and law enforcement will sit and talk to the family about what the step, next steps are gonna be. Susie just told us that Uncle Johnny has been messing with her. We're going to go out and talk to Uncle Johnny now, or DHR may put a safety plan in place. So there are a number of things that go on after that. Um, extended interview, um, this is just if a child did not disclose. We've had several cases where girls have had STDs and they've been like six, eight years old, and they have not disclosed an offender, but obviously we know that there's an offender. And so an extend, a forensic, um, extended forensic interview will take place, and it's still done by the interviewers, but it's done more um, a little session at a time so that the child can get used to talking to one person. And counseling, um, I told you we do counseling. This is our counseling room for the younger children. Most of the children we see are between 6 and 12, and so this is where that takes place. And the older kids... You know, set up a little groovy. They have their desk so that they can have boundaries because, you know, teenagers like to do that. Child, this is from a child that received counseling. Child Protect is fun. You get to let your feelings out by talking with a counselor. You even get to take home a teddy bear. So it, it's wonderful to get this kind of stuff back. Um, this is Abraham's client. This is years ago. I don't even know when that was, Abraham, probably eight, ten years ago. Um, this guy, the dad's in prison, and he had been raping her, and she, this is from high school, she had a wonderful mother and stepfather, and she sent this email to Abraham after counseling, 
Hey, Mr. Abraham, these are some pictures of my color guard from this year. We've been to two different competitions. I'm trying out for captain next year. I'm doing pretty good. I took the ASBAB today at school. I have AB honor roll this year so far. I still have nightmares, but not as often or as bad as they used to be. I want to thank you for listening to me and helping me out. And by the way, my stepdad is adopting me. I told Abraham when he showed us that, pack your bags and go home. You have saved the world. And you, you know, that is, when you see that, you know that what you're doing matters. Family advocacy, which is Tracy, does the intake, the initial <coughs> intake when the child gets there, and throughout the judicial, judicial process, which means that we meet with the family, we go through a court school, they meet with the DA, the child gets to sit on the witness stand. So they go through a lot of things to get the child used to um, talking in court. Um, serving, <coughs> I told you what we served. Last year we did 658 <coughs> forensic interviews, 63 children received counseling in 370 counseling sessions. 65% of these cases were child sex abuse cases. So what are the other cases that we see? Um, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, last week, one of those nights, Tuesday, Tracy and Abraham, Tuesday night, uh, Tracy and Abraham got a call. We are on call 24-7, by the way. Abuse doesn't happen 8 to 5, so we take turns. I'm not a real in-the-box person, so it's whoever, like, hey, y'all going to be around? Who's going to be around? Oh, I can. Let's, you know. So two of us have to come in. So Tracy and Abraham came in. Um, snake, boyfriend, whatever he was, um, decided to put the two-year-old into boiling water. And so we were called in because there were other siblings in the house. When you see police officers that can hardly stomach stuff, you know it's pretty bad. So we came in to interview uh, a sibling who was in the home at the time. The child is not so good. The child's in Birmingham, uh, third degree burns. They're pretty horrific. Um, so there you go. So that happened at, I guess, 11 o'clock, 11.30 on last Tuesday night, and they were there until about 2. So, um, yeah. So that's what we see, witness to murders, and these are statistics. Physical abuse, and then 12% is witnesses. Like that little boy would have been considered a witness. You can kind of see. Most of the offenders are male, and most of the victims are female. And that's just, you know, how it is statistically, even across the country. We serve... Um, Pretty much the, the demographics of our community is what we serve. So it matches what our makeup is. And I won't go through this. No, wait, I do, want, I do want you to see how big our budget is. It's pretty huge. And we bought the property next door. That's us on the tractor before they tore the old CARES ambulance company down. And we are getting ready to add on to our building. We've got some propaganda for you to take home with you and read about it. But we're really excited about this. Um, November 2016, we kicked off a capital campaign. Jean Drummond, who is also on the board at Leadership Montgomery, is a board member. She actually was on the board when I was hired. And um, she has contributed, and the building will be named after her. So that's Jean at our groundbreaking. Another sign. Willow with her heart hat on. <laughs> And that's breaking ground. Very exciting. And at the end, so what can you do? If you have notebook, paper, take a picture of this. The first thing I always ask for, I don't ask for money first. That always follows. Is prayer. Courage for our staff. Strength for our energy for our board. And peace for our clients, our children. That they will be able to sleep at night without the monsters. Donate in-kind items. All of these things save us on overhead, and that means that we can provide more services to children. Um, I know that in the next year we're going to need another counselor. We, we already know that. Um, and then finan financial donations. No amount is too small to help a child. If our goal is $500 and someone gives $250 and another person gives $150, is that $400? I'm not good at math, never. Um, Anyway, so we only had a dollar left. We got up to 499 and someone said, well, I only have a dollar to give, so it's not going to make a difference. I'm not going to give. It, it would, because that means we will have made our goal. 
So no amount is too small to help a child. So we always are in need of these. I really think that we could do a commercial for Lysol wipes because ours is probably the cleanest nonprofit ever. We Lysol it every time the kids leave. And that's the end of that. Um, I, I want you to, the, the last thing I really want you to know is as difficult as it is to go into work every day, it is amazing when you work, and I, I know I keep talking about the staff, but they are the ones who are really on the front lines with these kids, and they see the tears in their eyes, and they talk to them. So when someone calls and says, hey, you know what, I, I just, I, I, yesterday really sank me. I'm going to need to not come in until 11 today. Sure. You know, we're very flexible, and a lot of people ask, how do you get through the day? And that's how. Um, we're very informal because I know the stress that these families have been through, that when they come through the doors, they can sense that. They know that we're all happy, loving families. So I know that I've talked and talked. I think I have five minutes, Mike, for Q&A. Anyone have a question for Janet? 